Wednesday, we got our first look at the 84-year-old man charged with shooting a 16-year-old boy who went to his house by mistake. Andrew Lester was arraigned in a Missouri courtroom and he pled not guilty to first-degree assault and armed criminal action in the shooting of Ralph Yarl. Now, Yarl was shot in the head when he went to pick up his 11-year-old twin brothers from a friend's house, but he ended up ringing the doorbell at the wrong house. He mistook 115th Terrace for 115th Street. Since that shooting, we have seen several similar cases. In New York, a woman looking for a friend's house was shot and died after the car she was riding in mistakenly turned in at the wrong address and was met with gunfire in the driveway. 20-year-old Kaylin Gillis was traveling through the rural town of Hebron with three other people Saturday night. They were trying to turn the car around when the homeowner, 65-year-old Kevin Mo uh, Monahan, came out onto his porch and fired two shots. Sheriff Jeffrey Murphy with Washington County New York Sheriff's Office spoke to CNN about taking the suspect into custody. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Monahan was not cooperative at the scene and um, as stated, he, re he refused to, uh, to speak with us or come down the driveway. Uh, certainly, we're working to send officers up to his house. Uh, the house is on a hill, so uh, tactically that wouldn't have been sound, but um, he did um, you know, was taken into custody by the, the state police, actually, their special weapons team. Um, but he has not made any statements. He obtained a lawyer before he came out of the house, um, and he has not made any statements and, uh, quite frankly, has not shown any remorse. Now, in North Carolina, a man allegedly shot at a six-year-old, her parents, and a neighbor after a basketball rolled into his yard. Now, this is a photo of the suspect. His name is Robert Lewis Singletary. He's the father of a six-year-old. Now, the father, excuse me, of the six-year-old was shot and is recovering at this time. He is apparently in serious condition. The child was hit by a bullet fragment and had to get several stitches. Now, authorities are still searching for the suspect who's now on the run, who's going to be charged with assaulting his girlfriend as well with a sledgehammer. And that happened back in December. Oh, these cases. In Texas, a man is facing a felony charge after two high school cheerleaders were shot in a parking lot. Now, listen to what happened. One of those cheerleaders mistakenly got into the wrong vehicle. Pedro Rodriguez Jr. was taken into custody Tuesday and charged with deadly conduct. The shooting happened just after midnight when Heather Roth mistakenly entered a vehicle that Rodriguez was sitting in thinking it was her own. She then got back into her friend's car when Rodriguez allegedly approached the vehicle and shot Roth and fellow cheerleader Peyton Washington. Washington, the young woman pictured here, was transported to a local hospital in critical condition. Another cheerleader was treated and released at the scene. All of these other shootings happened shortly after the shooting of Ralph Yarl. And in Yarl's case, prosecutors say there was a racial component. Now we are joined by Ralph Yarl's attorney, Lee Merritt. Lee, great to see you. Thank you so much for joining the judge and I on the show. Truly appreciate it. Want to dig into some of the details of, of the young man's case. Um, first and foremost, there's been some speculation about a racial motive. The prosecutor came right out and said that he, he said there was. Initially, there was some question. They only had one side of the story. Eventually, it sounds like they got both sides. What do we know about the possibility of a racial component? Initially, the one side of the story that they had was that of Andrew Lester's. Right now, we don't know as much as we want to know about Andrew Lester, although evidence is coming out every day. Uh, we had a meeting earlier today with the Department of Justice, who has federal investigators looking to whether or not this constitutes a hate crime. And now under the law, there's certain points that need to be made to qualify as a hate crime, and we're just digging through the evidence now to see if we get there. You know, part of the good news, if, if there is any in a horrible case like this, Lee, don't misunderstand me, is that that it from the get-go from what I saw was immediately being investigated to see whether or not race was an issue and I think that's a good thing is that accurate is it one that they said immediately we've got to investigate this and see if this is a hate crime well the timeline in this case is a little complicated uh, the truth is we didn't see really much of a reaction from the prosecutors no statements no arrests no action whatsoever concerning the shooting last Thursday, Friday, Saturday. During that period, the family began to push for 
public outcry, the public outcry that you saw pick up on social media with celebrities tweeting about Ralph's shooting. It was only then that the prosecutors began to make these public statements about a racial motive and, and moving forward with criminal charges. And the family has felt that delay and is dealing with the consequences of that now. Lee, let me ask you this about uh, about the victim in this case, Ralph Yall. My understanding, you posted a picture, I believe it was yesterday, um, miraculous. Yeah. I was so happy to see him sitting next to you. Tell us how he's doing. What's going on with him? There it is. That's the picture. Yeah. Ralph is doing exceptionally well, given what he has gone through. Again, just one week ago today, uh, he was shot out of his head. And because of how well he's doing, you can almost forget the seriousness of the injury he sustained. He went through a serious brain surgery where the doctors had to remove a bullet and close him back up. Since then, he is walking. He's talking. He's interacting with his family. He hasn't quite left the house. He's having a difficult time controlling his emotions and reimagining re what happened to him over and over again as that head trauma begins to heal. It's amazing. I mean, truly, of course, our thoughts and prayers with the entire family with Ralph, but to see and hear that he is doing well, but you're right, that doesn't mean he's well, move on. There are a lot of long-term effects from an incident like this, including the emotional health for any individual, much less a child. So what, if anything, Lee, do you know that Ralph or his family may want people to hear about this circumstance and what comes next? Ralph's family has gone out of their way to say that they want to make sure that this case isn't treated like any other case. At the top of your show, you began to mention the horrific uh, series of shootings that, that were similar to Ralph's that happened after the fact. They want to make sure that race and uh, even national publicity doesn't play a role in the kind of justice they receive. They, they want to be advocates for equal justice across the board. You know what's interesting, and I got to ask you this, um, you're a defense attorney, um, clearly the defense in this case is going to be self-defense, the Castle Doctrine may come into play. Um, according to the statement to police, uh, Mr. Lester said, you know, at the age of 84, someone comes to my door, I was asleep in bed, it was 10 o'clock at night, I was scared for my life. Um, this is how I responded, if someone got in, um, I'm, I'm at a real disadvantage, being 84, are you afraid of that defense? Again, self-defense requires the jury to look at, look at it from the point of view of Andrew Lester. Um, are you afraid of that defense? You know, I, I do not believe that Mr. Lester will have the factual evidence to have that, that uh, defense read to a jury. You have to qualify for an affirmative defense. And before you qualify for a castle doctrine defense, you have to establish that someone threatened your home. In the presence of a 16-year-old boy ringing a bell, or a man ringing a bell or a tall, dark silhouette figure ringing a bell at your doorstep at 945 is not a deadly threat. And so you're not allowed under the law to assert a deadly threat in response to a doorbell being rang. Oh, so we may never get there. Right. We may never get there. Is there anything that you're able to tell us about what he said? The defendant in this case, did he say anything to Ralph? You know, we know he shot him in the head and then I understand he shot him again. Did he say anything? Well, what he said, according to Ralph's recollection, and re remember, the only time that Ralph has talked publicly or privately about the shooting is Friday from his bedside when he gave two detectives from the KCPD a statement. And he said then that Mr. Lester said to him, I don't want you to come back around here before firing the first shot. You're right. He then fired a second shot, as, as Ralph describes it, after he was on the ground. And there is consideration for charging him separately for each shot because... That another defense is if he asserts Castle Doctrine for the first shot, how does he justify the second shot? And he must justify every shot under the law. Yeah, and I think that second shot should qualify for even more serious charges, yeah, Lee. Yeah, yeah. I mean, are, are you concerned sense. that there are not more charges or, or higher charges, let's say attempted murder? Well, this case is still under investigation at the state, local, and federal level, so we may see more charges in the future. Here, uh, attempted murder under the Missouri statute, as explained to me by uh, Thompson, uh, the Clay County prosecutor, would not carry a more serious penalty and would require a higher burden for a set of facts that they don't believe that they can fulfill, and I trust his opinion on this subject. All right, fair enough. Thank you, Lee Merritt. Decision there. Yes, yep. and thank you, Lee Merritt, for going after seeking equal justice.